In this Q&A video, we're going to answer the question, how do I know which grade and category of fire detection system to install? Now, just before we explain the answer to this question, please be aware that this video is one of a series that we've made on the subject of fire alarms. They can be viewed individually, or you can click the link in the description below to view them as part of a free online training package to help you with your CPD and receive a certificate to prove you've completed the course. So in the previous videos, we've explained both the grades and categories of fire alarm system. So how do we know which we should be installing? Well, there's guidance given in both the practical guide to grade D fire alarm systems available on docstore.co.uk and the electrician's guide to fire detection and fire alarm systems published by the IET. The latter document contains a reproduction of Table 1 from BS 5839-6, which hopefully you know by now from watching these videos, is the code of practice for the design, installation, commissioning and maintenance of fire detection and fire alarm systems in domestic premises. This table gives us the minimum required standards for grades and categories of properties where the occupant characteristics are known or can be anticipated. However, these are the baselines to work from. The practical guide to grade D fire alarm systems makes two critical points, namely that national legislation and its associated guidance should be considered before a decision on the grade and category of system is made, and these minimum recommendations are not necessarily matched with guidance and legislation in each part of the UK. So basically what this is saying is that there may be requirements that specifically apply to the area we're working in that are more stringent and supersede the information in Table 1. Also, the decision as to which system and category to go for will be influenced by a risk assessment undertaken by the designer, but the information in Table 1 is a good starting point. In the IET guide, this table is identified as Table 5.3 and it splits dwellings into six classes. These are single family dwellings and shared houses with no floor greater than 200 meters squared in area, single family dwellings and shared houses with one or more floors greater than 200 meters squared in area, houses in multiple occupation or HMOs, sheltered housing, self-catering premises or premises with short-term paying guests, and supported housing. One of the keys to really understanding the information in this table is found by consulting the notes that go along with it. For example, you may be wondering what's meant by a single family dwelling, and if a family maybe takes in a lodger, does that then become a shared house? Well, single family dwellings has this A next to it, which directs us to note A at the bottom of the table. And that note reads, including premises with long-term lodgers, but not boarding houses, the latter of which are outside the scope of BS 5839-6. So that helps us to clarify that a family home with even a long-term lodger is still classed as a single family dwelling. And note B helps us to understand that shared houses are houses shared by no more than six persons generally living in a similar manner to a single family, e.g. houses rented by a number of students. So house sharing by students looking to dodge a halls of residence could still fall in this category rather than become a HMO. Notice as well the differentiation of floor areas being at 200 square metres. That is a pretty hefty footprint for a property. Just to give you an idea, the entire ground floor area of my three-bed home is around 66.4 square metres, including the attached garage. So a property would need to be three times the size of mine before it slipped into the upper category. Not impossible, but not common. The table then divides these areas into further scenarios based on ownership and the other physical attributes of the building and shows in the right hand column what the minimum, remember minimum, grade and category fire detection system should be both for new and existing properties. There are some very interesting notes relating to existing properties and we'll get to those in a moment. So let's take the example of my property and see if we can find it on the list. It's a two-story house and I own it and live in it, so we find it here lumped in with owner-occupied masonette with no floor above four and a half metres from ground level. It then says owner-occupied two-story house. The grade for a fire detection system in a new property is classed as D2 and the category would be LD2. We've explained what these grades and categories mean in detail in other videos in this series, so please go back and watch those if you can't remember exactly what they mean. But D2 basically means it's mains powered with battery backup, with the batteries able to be replaced by the occupier. 
There's a reference next to the category LD2 that sends us over to note D, which contains some information on what this category means for types and locations of detection, but we're going to cover that in the next video in this series. Hopping over to the existing premises column, the requirement for the same type of property is a little different. We can see there that it's only an F2 grade, which remember means it can be detectors that are only powered by batteries, and those batteries can be replaced by the occupier, which kind of makes sense because these can be added without tearing the house up for mains wiring. And the category was also taken a step down now to LD3, which you may remember is the bare minimum system with detector coverage in all circulation spaces that form part of the escape routes from the dwelling. However, there is an abundance of notes next to these from E to H, which read, E, a grade F1 system should be installed if there is any doubt regarding the long-term suitability or reliability of a battery-powered system, i.e. the ability to replace batteries. So this is suggesting if the occupier can't replace the batteries in the alarm themselves due to age or ability, then an F1 system should be installed, meaning that it has a non-replaceable battery, which generally have a longer lifespan. Note F then says, where electrical work such as a rewire is undertaken, a grade D, D1 or D2, category LD2 system should be installed. So this is removing the option to just volley in battery only detectors as a last minute fix if you're rewiring a property. You've got a perfect opportunity there to improve the safety of the property and its occupants during that process, so you need to undertake it. Note G makes the point that, in Scotland, under the Housing Act 1987 Order 2019, Grade F1, Category LD2 systems are required as a minimum in all existing dwellings. So showing that different countries in the UK have slightly different standards, as we mentioned in the previous video in this series. And finally, Note H reminds us that the LD3 should become Category LD2 if a risk assessment justifies the provision of additional detectors. Again, emphasising the point that these are minimum standards and that the decision should be made on risk assessment, which could well require a higher grade and category than outlined here. Now, we're not going to go through each and every aspect of this table, but there are some key points of interest. The first is looking at what happens when a property goes from being owner-occupied to rented out. A new or materially altered property goes from D2 to D1, meaning the smoke detector goes from having a user-replaceable battery to a tamper-proof non-replaceable battery to stop those pesky tenants from whipping the battery out for their TV remote. And for the existing property, the grade goes from F2 to D1, so from battery only to mains-powered battery backup. And the category goes up a notch from LD3 to LD2, offering a higher level of protection. In fact, every rented property has a D-grade system and never a category less than LD2, so you can't get away with battery-only systems for rented properties. Another interesting upgrade is for four-storey properties or any of those massive houses with a storey area bigger than 200 square metres that has more than one floor. These properties must have an A-grade system, which is the full central control and indicating equipment with separate sounders type system. Hopefully all those grand designers take that into account in their costings. There's another interesting point to note as well in connection with houses in multiple occupancy or HMOs. For smaller HMOs of one or two storeys with no floor greater than 200 square metres in area, new premises should have a grade D1, category LD1 system installed, and for existing premises, it's a D1 with an LD2 category. Again, that's logical. You'd want to keep your system tamper-proof and there's an increased level of protection for people who may not take as much care of their living space as they would if they owned it. Other types of HMO have grade D1 systems with mainly LD1 categories unless the individual dwelling units have more than one room, in which case it becomes LD2. However, looking at the bottom of the HMO list, we find that in communal areas of a HMO, we would need a grade A category LD2 system with detectors sighted in accordance with the recommendations of BS 5839-1 of 2017 for a category L2 system. So again, a system comprising the full central control and indicating equipment with separate sounders. So does this mean we have two separate systems running side by side in a HMO? Well, note M of the table tells us that the detectors in individual dwelling units may be incorporated within the system installed in communal areas, subject to compliance with clause 12.2b of BS 5839-6. So we'd probably just use the same system, but theoretically there could be two separate systems in place, but more likely there would be just one. However, it is really important to avoid sounding alarms and evacuating the building every time someone burns the toast. The clause mentioned in note M indicates there be provision within each HMO dwelling for A, 
silencing unwanted alarms when there is a local fire condition, and B, isolating the dwelling's detectors and sounders when activities are taking place that could cause a false alarm. So, some means would be required to temporarily disable the detector for a timed period to avoid a false alarm, such as by the use of a hush button that re-enables the detector after a short period of time has passed. You can really see the importance of using all the notes that this table incorporates by just the few examples we've considered here. And keep in mind that these are the minimum requirements and the system may have to be upgraded based on what the risk assessment finds about the property and the occupier. But why would these false alarms we just mentioned happen in the first place? Indeed, what are the different types of detectors and where should they be used? To find out, check out this video here or click on the link in the description below to watch it as part of our free training package to help you with your CPD and receive a certificate as well. All that remains in this video is to say thank you very much for watching.